Hallo? Hallo? Welkom. Are you hearing me? Yes, go yes. ahead. Okay, it's fine. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today at the 7th APSP COVID-19 Research Webinar on the theme Facing the Challenges uh, in Vaccine Distribution. We particularly thank our special guest speakers, uh, Dr. Uh, Margaret Dalcomo, Dr. Thiago Hoca, and uh, Dr. Prashant Yadav. This webinar is part of uh, a series organized by FAPESP, the State of Sao Paulo Research Foundation, with the support from the Global Research Council. But um, uh, first of all, I would like to give the uh, floor to Professor Luis Eugenio Mello, the Scientific Director of FAPESP, to open the session and uh, welcome. Please, Professor Luis Mello. Thank you, Victor. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good night uh, to you all, depending on uh, where you are. Uh, we uh, are currently uh, having our seventh uh, webinar, as uh, already mentioned, on the COVID uh, series. Uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, as the name uh, already says, uh, of uh, global proportions, it's a, a global event. Uh, for which uh, we all uh, rely on a number of uh, advances that uh, science may provide. And a vaccine is uh, one of the uh, key elements uh, on this uh, fight. Uh, however, uh, delivering uh, a vaccine is as much a challenge as producing a vaccine. We uh, initially uh, all concentrated on producing uh, an effective vaccine and a number of those uh, seem already uh, at hand. However, as we now uh, uh, have uh, a, at a very, very clear uh, aspect, delivering that vaccine to different populations in uh, different corners of the world. And to that end, Brazil, for instance, it's uh, quite a, a relevant example with uh, a very distant uh, locations and communities. So distributing that uh, vaccine is not uh, uh, easy at all and uh, provides on itself a big challenge. So uh, this webinar is for us to discuss and hear from experts on uh, that uh, same topic. And uh, in name of FAPESP, I would like to thank uh, very much all of the uh, expert uh, speakers that uh, have kindly accepted our invitation for today's event. And with that, uh, I hand back the word uh, to you, Victor. Thank you, Professor Luis Mello. Well, uh, some vaccines against COVID-19 with uh, different technological approaches are ready, even though they have not yet been approved by regulatory agencies in Brazil and in other countries. However, several barriers must be faced in the distribution such as the manufacture of vaccines, the need for two doses, the requirements of uh, the cold chain, the anti-vaccine movement, the selection of priority groups of people for vaccination, and the dissemination of vaccines to the vulnerable population. In addiction, access to vaccine is likely to be unequal, both within and between countries. Therefore, the logistics of vaccine distribution, especially in low and middle income countries, it's a major public health challenge. Certainly, our team of distinguished speakers will address some of these issues and outline some of the strategies for overcome them. Well, um, now, I would like to briefly clarify the rules of uh, the webinar. Each speaker will have uh, 20 minutes for his presentation. And after all the presentations, we will move on to the question stage. For questions or comments, please submit them to the address live at fapesp.br. We'll organize the questions and uh, forward them to the panelists. Uh, 
Now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Thiago Roca. Dr. Roca is an industrial pharmacist who has been working for more than 13 years in several areas related to production, technology transfer, validation, quality assurance, and compliance related to vaccines and biopharmaceuticals. He currently holds the position of manager of strategic partnerships and business development at the Institute, uh, the Butantan Institute. Uh, he represents the Butantan Institute on the executive committee of vaccines manufacturers in developing countries. Dr. Hoka, please, uh, this screen is yours. Thanks, Professor Victor. It's a pleasure. Thanks also. It's a pleasure to be also with Professor Luis, uh, Dr. Margarete, Professor Yadav here. I hope all of you are fine and safe during this distinguished, distinguished times. And also thank you, Ana, to, to support me with the organization with this webinar and for inviting. Uh, it's a great topic to discuss uh, since the, the, the beginning of the pandemic as a, a person that it's involved with, with the vaccine and partnerships here at Butanta. I missed a lot the discussion regarding the challenges for the distribution because the, the vaccine, the development of the vaccine was in course, but nobody was talking about uh, temperature, about cold chain, about logistics. And, and this is a very important point because uh, in, in the end, it's how we, we can get the vaccine to arrive to the people. So uh, it's very important to discuss this point. Uh, I had in, in more in the past uh, experience working uh, for the with the partners of Butanta, uh, bring some vaccines or part of the vaccines that I will also explain uh, to the country. And, and uh, I had the opportunity to see uh, what's the challenge that we, we, we face in the chain. So uh, I hope in the end we, you can share your questions with me, but uh, at the beginning, it's important to say, and regarding the Brazil scenario, uh, nowadays about 40%, 40%, 40% of uh, the budget for medicines of the Ministry of Health is for biological products. Uh, almost half of the budget, indeed. Uh, and but in terms of unit, they represent just four percent. So it, it's a big budget for biological products. Inside of biological products, we have the vaccines. So it, it's a very important in terms of costs. And most of these biological products, you know, that are compo com uh, you have components of proteins. And proteins are quite unstable under heat, and they need to, to have at least a uh, cold chain to to eight degrees Celsius. Even sometimes these vaccines or biological products are freeze dry or lyophilized. So even in the solid state, they, most of them needs to be keep storage uh, under uh, uh, refrigeration conditions that we, we, it's important to concept here as uh, two to eight, two eight Celsius degrees. Uh, for vaccine manufacturing, uh, all these steps of manufacturing require some kinds of uh, conditions to storage. Uh, if we think in the beginning of uh, the early production of the vaccine, if we consider a strain, a cell, uh, these banks, our master seeds or master cell or virus seed, they need to be storage under ultra, ultra freezing like uh, minus 70, minus, minus 80 Celsius degrees. And when we start the, the manufacturing of this uh, virus, the cells or this, uh, uh, we need to storage all the other materials, all the raw materials under also special conditions, like some buffers, some uh, components from media, cell media culture, we need to have uh, special conditions for them. 
in even the process, most of the sometimes of the process of the, the production of vaccine, sometimes requires refrigeration, even using uh, cold cold water to reduce the temperature, even even considering the uh, the, the vaccine as a protein based uh, or a virus based, we need to keep all the process or most of the process under refrigeration. This is a generic view for sure. Some vaccines, they, the vaccines have different uh, manufacturing uh, process. Each one has different requirements, but it's important to say not the vaccine uh, as a finished good should be keep it uh, ref refrigerated. So even when we imported the raw materials or part of the, the, the vaccine, uh, part of the vaccine materials to be produced, uh, most of them need some special conditions for storage. And talking about the, the cold chain, it's important to highlight one specific point. The cold chain needs a good electrical network. This is the basis. The basis is the electrical network that supports a cold, a cold, a cold room or a refrigerator. You need to have a stable uh, electric network. And what we we see here in Brazil, and it's uh, it's new that that we we, we 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 turn on the TV and we see the news what is going on with the electric uh, network in Brazil. Here we are in Sao Paulo, so sometimes it's difficult to, to see uh, this challenge for a, a person that have the electric electricity at home, but when we look, especially other places in Brazil, we saw recently in Amapá the blackout for almost one month of blackout. So how can you, we have a stable electric network to support uh, refrigeration for even uh, two to eight Celsius to eight degrees, or even for ultra freezing minus 70, minus eight, if we don't have uh, uh, a stable electric network. Other states that it's very important to highlight is Roraima. Roraima is also in the north of Brazil, and Roraima is not connected to the Brazilian uh, supply of uh, electricity. So Roraima depends from Venezuela supply and for a current electric supply. So uh, it, it's a challenge for these places and other places that are in, in some far uh, west or far north in Brazil are requires a, a, a suitable and a stable electric network. This is one uh, one challenge that uh, I highlight here because uh, how low the temperature is, more uh, stable electricity you need. So. One thing, it's a refrigerator, common refrigerator, as we have at home, that requires uh, a good, uh, stable electric, electric network. But if you, you think about uh, ultra freezing, it, the challenge is, is higher because it consumes more electricity. So uh, this is an impo important point to, to highlight. Considering also that in Brazil, we have more than 33,000 of uh, vaccination room. So we, in the end of the distribution, the vaccines are stored under this more than 33,000 vaccination room and, and the electric conditions for this uh, vaccination room is very important to get this product under uh, stable conditions for storage. Just here in Sao Paulo, we have more than 5,000 vaccination rooms. So, uh, it's a challenge to have all this uh, vaccination room uh, under a good and stable conditions for electricity and cold chain. Uh, regarding logistics to reach this 33,000 uh, vaccination rooms we, we have, and also in our country, uh, basically three to four different uh, formats of transport. So the trucks, that need to be refrigerated as well, because you cannot transport the vaccines in a common truck. We need a, a 
cold chain uh, trucks. We don't have too much companies that are specialized, especially for pharma conditions uh, to transport the, the vaccines. One thing is to transport food, other thing is to transport medicines. The, the requirements, the, the controls are, are much higher. So sometimes it's a challenge to find uh, companies for logistics here in Brazil. We have, but it's a limitation. But to have trucks with uh, a good uh, control of the temperature and to keep all the, the transportation under the specific range of two to eight. For ultra fuse, ultra freezing transportation uh, trucks, uh, I don't I don't know from how to transport for minus 70 or minus 80. We need a different condition, different containers, but the trucks itself are for this temperature, two to eight Celsius degrees. Other challenge for transportation by land in Brazil sometimes is the are the conditions of the roads and especially in the north, in the northeast, or even the countryside, it's a challenge to transport and to, to get some far place uh, with these conditions of transportations and not just the temperature, but the, the load to arrive. Other, other format for transportation that especially for importation can be the naval maritime transportation. Uh, it's one way that we have here with the experience now to bring a part of vac rabies vaccine for maritime, so it's a option to to bring. And uh, also, we need to think that in Brazil also we use the rivers to transport the, the vaccines. It's important to remind that Manaus it's a capital, maybe it's the, the the biggest capital in the north of Brazil, and it's a capital that is not connected with other capital by land. So if you want to go to Sao Paulo or other capital to Manaus, you cannot go by land. You can go by boat or you can go by, 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 by a flight. So uh, sometimes this is a challenge that we, fight, we face for the vaccine distribution in our country. Uh, how to transport so these vaccines from outside from, to enter in Brazil or even to transport inside? We have basically two different uh, kinds of containers that we can use to transport the, the, the vaccines. So we have the passive container, that is the container basically that you prepare with uh, uh, some dry ice or some uh, uh, temperature, keep it like, like a gel that you can keep, you can assemble a pallet, for instance, of a vaccine and uh, with this gel packs, you can cover the pallet and this configuration can keep for some days or some hours the, the product between the temperature 2 to 8. With the dry ice, it's possible to reach uh, low temperatures like minus 80, but you need to replace the ice time to time. So it, it's a kind of a container that we classify as a passive container. And we you have uh, we we also know that we have another container that we call this a, a active container. That's a kind of a portable refrigerator that you can see sometimes in the image some images in on TV or the internet when you see a, a container called the Envirotainer. Envirotainer it's a brand, but it's a active container that we use for transport, especially for flight transportation between uh, international flights and by battery or by plugging in the electric system in electric network this uh, refrigerator can keep the vaccine uh, or the product two to eight Celsius degrees. Uh, I had an experience that it seems that it's the more uh, the more safe way to, to transport the vaccine but sometimes, if we don't, we don't have a good infrastructure, it can be a challenge. So uh, the, the challenge for the active container sometimes can be the electric network, and as I explained, because while you don't have the supply of electricity, the container has the battery that can keep the container working and refrigerating the product. But if the battery fails and the second battery it don't, don't, doesn't work, 
you need to plug in an electric system, in an electric network. I remember in 2012, 2011, when we started to bring a lot of these containers to Brazil, we faced the challenge in the airports to have uh, enough plugs to connect to these containers, or even the, st the stability of the network to support uh, dozens of these containers plugged at the same time. So after some time, the, the airports here in Brazil, especially I'm talking about Sao Paulo and Rio, I, I don't have an idea how it is working in other airports over the country, but even here in Sao Paulo and Rio, it was a challenge to plug all these containers at the same time. The infrastructure improved a lot. Uh, we remember that most of the, our airports were were privatized on 2013 or 14 because of the World Cup. It improved a lot the airports and the infrastructure, but it can be a challenge in other airports that we are not uh, uh, are not prepared to receive a lot of these containers. Other important point for these electric containers, the active containers, uh, it's it's because they are outsourced. So uh, you you rent this container. So the, the manufacturers or the importers don't have these containers. So you need to rent. And sometimes, uh, especially during some seasons, like for the flu campaigns, uh, for the health, uh, North Hemisphere, or uh, the South Hemisphere, that we have a lot of flu vaccines being transported over the world. This to rent uh, these containers, it's a challenge. The big farmers uh, had great contracts with the this, this companies that rent the invite containers. Sometimes you can find a lack of invite the active containers to rent. So the passive container, it's an alternative for that. But the, the issue of the passive container is that we, ha we have also a logistic reverse and a lot of uh, a lot of trash to, to transport back or to dispose in the end of the process that you disassemble the, the pallet or the, the, the material that you are transporting. So this is the two alternatives that we have for uh, transportation. Uh, in terms of quality, both can, can uh, work, but all of them we, we have to pay attention. All of them we need to validate that it's a stud, the stud validation to transport or to qualify this in accordance with your conditions of a quantity of product that you, you want to, to keep uh, refrigerated. So you need to, to do a, a, stud, a validation study of the transport and to prove for the uh, like a visa or FDA that it's possible to keep for X hours, this vaccine under two to eight conditions during a, a certain period, during a logistic, uh, the, the, a logistic route. So, uh, and when we, we face a temperature excursion, what is a temperature excursion? When the temperature of the, the product, uh, it's below or above, the temperature of two to eight Celsius degrees. Also for uh, freezing conditions like minus 20 or minus 80, when we, we have a difference of 10, 10 Celsius degrees, you have a temperature in excursion. So to, to have a, a product in the, under a safe conditions, we need to investigate what happened in this failure because uh, when you, you enter with the vaccine in the country and you have a, this situation in the graph, you observe that the temperature was uh, above or below. You need to explain to the authorities, to Anvisa or to FDA, what happened and what is the impact with the product. We had the experience in the past to throw away batches because of that. So you need to have a keep, a, a keep, uh, keep safe condition to transport your load. And when this situation happens, you need to have some stress study for the product. That is a stability study that you prove that your product sometimes, if the product keep it under 
or uh, uh, with the temperature below or 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 above the, the specification, what's the impact in the stability of the product? Sometimes the pe people think that the, the most common uh, issues is above of eight Celsius degrees when the temperature, especially in a tropical country like in Brazil, if the, the vaccine gets temperature above, it's more common. But we we saw a lot of uh, issues also with vaccines that should be keep it two to eight Celsius degrees were frozen, and this sometimes you, you don't have a study to to prove that the vaccine keeps safe and the efficacy. If no safe and efficacy, the vaccine should be exposed. And this is a is an issue because the companies lost a lot when they don't have a study to prove that the vaccine can be used. Uh, nevertheless, the, the temperature excursion uh, they should be investigated because it's something that you don't want to, to see in the routine or uh, it's something that should be very punctual, cannot be every batch that you import or to, you bring to the country every time you, you face a, a, a temperature excursion. But you, you should investigate what happened. If you, it was a problem with the machine, in the case of the active container, if it's an issue in the material, in the, in the case of the passive container, you should uh, investigate if it's not a, a, a person or a, a manpower issue that committed some deviation. And it's important to, to highlight as well that during an importation of the, the vaccine, uh, most of the process, the, the manufacturer or the importer, they don't have access to the product. So the product is uh, under control of sometimes subcontractors sub like the agent or the, the logistic company, sometimes even the customs, they, they keep the, the load and you, you should guarantee that the vaccine will keep under these certain conditions the specification during all the process and this is a challenge uh, now we, we we have a lot of uh, sensors that we use to monitor we call like data loggers these data loggers are the the sensor that you you monitor the temperature under the the transport and uh, with these sensors, you, you provide the graphics uh, to the agency or to release the vaccine in the country. So if the sensors also fail, you can, you can have an issue to release uh, the vaccine in the country. And for, for, for uh, finalize my speech, uh, one other other way to control the vaccine temperature, not control, but to monitor, at least you know that the vaccine is good or not. Nowadays, we have some labels that these labels change the color when you, you when the vaccine is uh, exposed under a temperature out of the specification. So if the vaccine is, is frozen, uh, the, the color changes of the label and the uh, when we, we, we have the temperature above as well. So uh, in the end, the person that we you use the, the vaccine, you know that it, the, this vaccine, it's in a good or not, not, not a good conditions of storage. So this is an important uh, measure that some vaccines has. Uh, last point that it's important to say that uh, here in Brazil, we, we have a lot of uh, rules by Anvisa, a lot of guidelines. One of guidelines that I recommend uh, who is interesting to know about is the from the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineering, a good practice on the cold chain. Over from Professor Victor, it's up to you now. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hoka, for this clear presentation. Very interesting. Well, uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Margaret Dalcomo. 
Dr. Don Como is a well-known pulmonologist and research at the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation in Rio de Janeiro. She has broad experience in tuberculosis control in Brazil and in African countries. She was a member of the advisory group of the Brazilian Ministry of Health for COVID-19 in the early period of the pandemic. She coordinates the Brazilian arm of the international study to access the possible effects of BCG vaccination against uh, COVID-19. During the pandemic, Dr. Dalcomo proved to have excellent scientific communication skills, helping to clarify several aspects of COVID-19 for Brazilian society through the media. Dr. Dalcomo, please, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, um, good afternoon, or good evening. <laughs> I don't know whether <laughs> they are listening to us abroad. So thank uh, Victor, the Professor Wunsch for this invitation and Luis Mello for this very kind invitation from PAFAPESP and for this privileged uh, opportunity to sort of share some of my feelings. And I am not an, a vaccine expert. I am, as you said, as you mentioned in my background, I am a respiratory physician by background. I am a clinical uh, researcher at Fiocruz and currently I am conducting really the the, the, the multicentric BCG vaccination phase three trial in Brazil with another colleague, the Professor Julio Croda. So I, I would like to provide you, first of all, uh, uh, before to sort of read and translate a, a summary of the, the state of the art of the vaccine in, in which we are more, more I would say, deeply um, involved, which is the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. But I would like to provide you a sort of overview about the Brazilian situation for our international colleagues. So uh, first of all, I would like to reinforce that it is very amazing that in eight months, in nine months, we have reached such a remarkable results in terms of producing vaccines in such a, I would say, um, short while. Uh, secondly, it's very uh, clear for us that for acute diseases, and this is something that is commonly asked us, what do you think about? If it will be a, a finer or more reliable to have uh, medicines, regimens, or protocols. And I used to respond, none, no, because the history tell us and teaches us about the chronic and acute diseases. And for chronic diseases, as, as we know, and as we are very aware of, uh, like for, for instance, AIDS and hepatitis B, uh, and hepatitis C, I'm sorry, uh, the, the regimens and protocols are very efficient, as we know. And so for the acute uh, diseases, for instance, the viruses, as we know, the great solutions is vaccines, as we know. So we have to, it's quite understandable that the world had put all its efforts in terms in this short while of time to have reached the phase three of 13 vaccines in the world. And in Brazil, we are having what I would say a, a good protagonism in terms of provide uh, good conditions to, to carry out uh, phase three trials. As we know, we are having five vaccines in phase three trials in Brazil. So this, this is for you to, to understand more or less the situation. In Brazil, we have, so this, um, we have this, um, this as uh, my predecessor mentioned, we have a very uh, good experience in vaccination. The National Program of Immunization, which we call the PNI, PNI, is very skilled in terms of provide campaigns. As we know, Brazil is a continental country with very uh, difficult uh, and complicated uh, to be reached regions, for instance, in the Amazon, in regions uh, in the northeast of the country, which we call Sertão, in which the, the, the quality of infrastructure to provide the cold chain is complicated. But we have a very good experience accumulated in this last three or four decades in Brazil, providing campaigns, for instance, for polio, for measles with very, very good outcomes. So, uh, 
the situation in terms of uh, regulatory, uh, before uh, coming on this specifically on AstraZeneca and Oxford vaccine, uh, is, is also something very, I would say, well established in the country. We have our regulatory uh, institution, which is Anvisa, that uh, in, in, this, um, in this last time is be, has been very, I would say, uh, careful in terms of uh, uh, waiting, wait for the submission of, this, um, uh, of these approvals. And when I'm talking about approvals, I'm talking about either the, the emergency approval and the, the definitive approval of the vaccines that, are, that have been in, in developing nowadays. So what we know is that Anvisa recently visit and make, made a visit to China in order to visit the production of the, the Sinovac vaccine, as well as the AstraZeneca vaccine, which has been developing in, in China. China. And so both visit has just finished and we are going to receive their report in this next uh, coming days. So what, what do we have objectively in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, let me open my summary here. Um, what do you have? What do we have? We have preliminary results of the clinical studies of phase three published in this uh, currently December. Uh, less than one year after the initiation of the development of vaccines against this new uh, sanitary emergency, which is, which is this, the COVID-19. And they have been published in good uh, scientific magazines after the evaluation of uh, independent committees. It is quite worthy for me to point out that the new platforms, technological platforms of third generation that include vaccines of uh, acid, uh, nucleic acid vaccines, as well as the derived from viral vectors, they have shown in these studies uh, surprisingly and amazing results with a yield, a very favorable yield over uh, quite uh, above the, the limits, the, the cutoff limits preconized by the, the, the international authorization, including the WHO. In the case of the vaccine of uh, RNA, uh, uh, RNA developed by the, the Pfizer, and the results show a high efficacy of the vaccines in the protection of the infection, utilizing the new technology of the synthetic vaccines. In the case of the platforms of the virals, uh, the, the, the viral vectors, as uh, for instance, like the, the Oxford AstraZeneca developed one, which will be incorporated in the Brazilian portfolio, uh, particularly in the Fiocruz portfolio. And I have to mention and clarify you that the Fiocruz, as well as the Institute Butantan, we are responsible for uh, uh, more or less 60 or 65% of the whole amount of the vaccines distributed free of charge in Brazil. And so uh, Fiocruz uh, distributed has the the 80%, for instance, to give you another example of the production of the yellow fever vaccine. And Brazil is the responsible for the distribution for most of the countries in the world with a very, very good uh, vaccine for yellow fever. So coming back uh, for the platform of the viral, uh, viral vectors, uh, as, um, as I mentioned with the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, uh, we have already analyzed the publication of the outcomes of the phases one or two. And in addition to the stimulation of the immunological response uh, in the production of antibodies, as well as the, in, and the activation of the cellular response, according to the data published recently in August of this year, and again, in the important, uh, according to the important observation of the strong response shown in the elder people at the same level of the young people in the, according to the preliminary results published in November of this year in the Lancet as well, uh, it has been the announcement of the achievement of the data that could permit the evaluation, the statistic evaluation, I mean, uh, pre the preliminary statistical evaluation about the efficacy of this product. 
And before the announcement of this data, there were ev evaluated by the independent committee uh, following up the, the clinical study that recommended that the data would be open and again re-evaluated by revisors, independent revisors for, your, the, for, for its publication. And it is, was actually done uh, in the Lancet in this, this currently month. So the, 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 the amount of this information is, has been analyzed as well by specialists nominated by authorities, sanita sanitary authorities of the important agencies, the regulatory agencies, I mean, uh, representing Brazil, representing the European community as well as the United Kingdom. And in this provisional analysis of the phase three, what is amazing is that there were divulgated information about the small number 131 of COVID-19 identified in the study, achieving levels of efficacy above 70%, combining, combining data from different regimens of doses. So it provided, uh, from my point of view, personally speaking, a sort of confusion in this analysis of this recent publication in the, in the Lancet as a sort of uh, threshold, uh, desirable, I would say, threshold for the, for the, for the um, I would say, confronting of the, the necessity of confronting this, this pandemic, which 62 uh, between 62 with a very, I would say, broad in the confidence interval, which is not comfortable, uh, linking 62 to 19, depending on the arm of the study and the adopted regimen. So another important confirmation obtained in these studies and one of the main objectives of the utilization of the vaccine was the absence, the absolute absence. And this is something that really uh, amazed me uh, personally as a physician, as a respiratory physician, was the absence, the absolute absence of severe disease uh, or hospitalization in the volunteers that received the vaccine, confirming, from my point of view, the observation, the previous observation obtained in, in, animal, in animal models about the necessity and vaccinating uh, to avoid uh, uh, severe manifestations with, for me, it will be already something very, very worthy. Uh, and it was published in the Nature, in Nature magazine in October of this year. With this important advance in the evaluation, in the clinical evaluation, uh, the project of the vaccine COVID-19 Fiocruz AstraZeneca, how it is going to be called in Brazil, because we are talking about the, the, the full nationalization process of producing. Uh, what we have done, we have done a, a continuous submission uh, it started at the end of, uh, the, men, of the month of September at vis-a-vis uh, um, uh, -vis the Anvisa uh, evaluation. So we call it in Portuguese. I don't know whether this expression could be used in English, but a continuous uh, submission. And so Anvisa already received the first package. Uh, the first package about the, the information about the vaccine itself, the, the first studies in animal model. Uh, in the end of October, early November, we have submitted the, the second package about the control of production and the control of quality. And it has been done the visit of China uh, uh, factory, as I mentioned, and we are about to submit uh, the, the, the third package about the sterilization and uh, the other good practices in vaccine production in after we have received the IFA, the IFA, the, 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 the pharmaceutic product from AstraZeneca, which is scheduled to arrive in Brazil in the early January, in the first days of January. So this is more or less the, the state of the art of the, of the, the production in Brazil. And uh, what I would like to comment in addition to this uh, to very uh, brief uh, comments I have made is about the infrastructure. Uh, when we discussed about the, the conditions of Brazil, it's for me inacceptable. And I have already started the discussion with the, the private initiative as well. Uh, that Brazil 
could refuse a vaccine, for instance, a platform of RNA, the platform of with very, I would say, low uh, cold chain like Pfizer is utilizing. So a country like Brazil should have several different vaccines to be offered free of charge to our population utilizing what we call our SUS, which means our national health. And so this, this has been discussed in a very serious uh, collaboration between the public institutions, the governmental institution, and uh, I wouldn't uh, consider, I uh, would say, it acceptable that capitals in Brazil could not have uh, logistics and infrastructure conditions to receive a vaccine utilizing freezer minus 70 or minus 80. So in the capitals of Brazil, in all capitals, except the special situation uh, of Amapá that my, my colleague mentions uh, previously, but all capitals, we could have generators, we could have uh, electricity chain. And if what we don't have is enough, I would say, uh, 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 freezers or, or refrigerators um, required to, to this kind of platform. So, but it is perfectly doable. It is perfectly, I would say, uh, manageable uh, if we have the vaccines already uh, available in the country. What we don't have now is any vaccine already approved. What, how I do envisage this, the Brazilian situation? Uh, for me, uh, and I'm going to discuss it again this evening in, uh, with the director of the, of the Butantan Institute in Sao Paulo uh, in a television uh, chain. And uh, I do envisage that we'll have the approval and uh, not desirably, I would say, the emergence approval. Why? Because emergence approval does not uh, permit, does not allow, uh, according to the Brazilian regulation and legislation, the commercialization, commercialization of the vaccines. So emergence approval is not something that it is, it would be, I would say, uh, uh, manageable, but it is not the most desirable. The most desirable for me would be the final, the finalizing the phase three, the publication of the results. And it amazed me a little bit why the AstraZeneca did not submit the, 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 the asking for approval before the publication of the results like the other platforms done has have done. And so, but I, I couldn't respond this this question. So this is more or less, uh, Victor, the situation of uh, how I, I do analyze the Brazilian situation and um, I'm completely at your disposal to respond uh, uh, further questions from our audience. And thank you so much again for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Dacomo, for your sensible talk. Well, uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Prashant Yadav. Dr. is a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development and a lecturer at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Yadav, it's uh, a globally recognized scholar in the area of healthcare supply chains. And uh, outside the academia, Dr. Iadav works closely with governments and global organizations in the area of policy and the strategy design for healthcare supply chains. Currently, he is working as a strategy leader supply chain at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dr. Yadav, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Victor, and thank you to Colin Papest for organizing this very interesting seminar. I learned um, a, a few things from what Dr. Margaret described, so it was good to hear um, directly from scientists who are following the vaccine development landscape very closely. One quick correction, I don't work for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That is an old, I guess, bio I used to. Um, I am going to talk about the logistics of distributing 
vaccines and in particular COVID-19 vaccines based on my own work and also looking at the work of colleagues who are tracking this in multiple countries around the world. Um, I'm a logistician and a supply chain professional by training, so I don't have training in medicine, uh, similar to Dr. Margaret, uh, just a disclaimer at the, at the start. I want to share a few slides um, just because it'll make it easier to lay out a few points uh, to all of you who are joining us. So in April, when, like uh, Professor Victor was saying, when, when a lot of the focus of attention was, can we develop a COVID-19 vaccines, uh, a couple of colleagues and I had written a paper which was on what will have to go into ensuring an equitable global distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. And since then, I've been looking at how the landscape has developed and what is the role of good distribution systems and supply chains in ensuring one, equitable distribution and two, when we are looking at allocating limited initial doses in a very targeted manner for priority populations, how can the supply system or the distribution system help in achieving such targeting? So I want to start by describing the manufacturing and distribution system for vaccines and in particular COVID-19 vaccines, because there are multiple layers of complexity here. And oftentimes we jump only to one of them, which is, oh, some of the vaccines require ultra cold chain. But in reality, there are uh, many other things which are equally, if not more complex. So first we've got to understand vaccine manufacturing and, and um, the colleague from Instituto Butana um, would be able to share uh, a lot more given their experience in this area. But very broadly speaking, uh, we have two stages in vaccine manufacturing, the, the bulk vaccine or the antigen, I still call it antigen even though some of the newer platforms don't necessarily have that, but antigen manufacturing and fill and finish. They typically occur in different sites. So there has to be a transport from the site which is doing the antigen manufacturing to the site which is doing formulation fill and finish. We also need vials or some form of a primary packaging container in which the vaccine will be uh, packaged. Typically we think of glass vials, newer technologies are also being developed for this. And then we need uh, a variety of other things. We need excipients, we need, um, for some of the newer ones, we need specialized lipids. Uh, many of the vaccines which are adjuvanted, they require an adjuvant. So all of these other things also have to come uh, to the site of fill and finish. And this manufacturing network is at times global. No country has been able to say, we can have all of this within our national boundaries. And the reasons are, um, one has to do with how the supply chains for manufacturing very specialized things are organized. Uh, a particular adjuvant manufacturer may be located in Europe. A particular lipid manufacturer may be located in Canada or Austria. So no matter where the finished production is occurring uh, or the fill and finish is occurring, some of these input materials will have to come through a global supply chain. And a global supply chain will expose us to risks such as air cargo capacity, other things that have been more challenging in the last seven, eight months related to international transport, export, import, trade, etc. Some of the adjuvants, as we know, are also naturally occurring substances, so they're not manufactured in a factory, but grow naturally, whether it is a squalene-based adjuvant or it is a, a so-called tree-based adjuvant. Uh, the, the two leading candidates, which are um, either approved, authorized, or likely to be authorized soon, uh, don't have them, but still it's worth keeping in mind as we think about the longer term view of COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing. Once vaccines are, um, are formulated and filled and finished in a, in a while, uh, then there is need for air cargo. If that manufacturing or that fill and finish is not occurring within the country, which it is hard to ensure for a diverse portfolio of vaccines. So, you know, large countries can say, uh, we'll have 
our leading candidate to be filled and finished uh, within the country. But if you are thinking about uh, four or five different vaccines and maintaining a diverse portfolio, then perhaps some of them will have to come uh, from outside and will have to be imported. So it requires having the right air cargo capacity, which as we know has been very limited. Uh, the reason being that much of air cargo is carried in the belly of a passenger plane. And because passenger flights have been running at a much lower rate, uh, that means about 30% of the air cargo capacity has been taken out of the market. So we need specialized cargo operators, whether it is the large cargo freight companies, which are flying uh, freight planes or some of the logistics companies, or in some cases, specialized global agencies, which have uh, started playing a more important role in this. Then uh, it's not just the vaccine vial, we need syringes to, uh, to vaccinate. And syringes are um, plastic, low, uh, low volume, or sorry, low, uh, low density of packaging. So typically, at least historically, we've always shipped syringes on, on a boat. Um, and it's just not economical to ship them through air cargo. So if we continue that way, then I think we have to think about are the syringes ready um, in the country, or if they have to be brought in for, let's say, the second phase. I'm sure for the first phase of distribution, most countries have enough to, to cater to the healthcare professionals or the high priority groups. But when we get to the second phase, when we are starting population level um, vaccination drives, you know, ensuring that syringes are in place and we need the planning to bring them through boat or if they are gonna come through air cargo, then we need to think about that as well. And then is the distribution in the country. So once it is imported or if it's domestically manufactured, then it goes through a series of distribution and logistics steps which um, Tiago uh, was describing earlier. And um, while we, we didn't historically need specific materials during the distribution chain, uh, at least two of the candidates as has been talked about, which may require uh, specialized ultra cold chain equipment. And if we don't have that, then specialized containers which require dry ice. So there is a material need going into the supply chain at the distribution segment as well, which is for dry ice. And we know uh, dry ice is not something that is uh, widely available. The typical users are the food, the ice cream and, and the, the frozen foods industry. Um, so um, yeah, it'll, it'll have to be you know, very carefully worked out. Okay, so um, key things that are challenging here, in addition to what I described, one is that the, this entire complex system doesn't know what is the product that it has to move and what quantity is getting allocated to this. And it's not because of someone not sharing this information. It is just that there is uncertainty about which products and how much. Um, and unless those uncertainties are resolved, it is very hard to do a detailed supply chain plan. Right? Those supply chain plans can at best be scenario planning. Scenario A, I get 100,000 units. Scenario B, I get 1 million units. Uh, and, and a lot of countries and subnational jurisdictions are facing that challenge, how to plan when you don't know what is coming to you, when and how much. Should I buy ultra cold chain fridges or wait uh, for my hospital or for my state or for my city. Um, the other is that because many of the, uh, the leading candidates, including the, one that have, uh, the ones that have been emergency use authorized, uh, require two doses separated by two to three weeks. This means the need for information systems at the very last mile of distribution to track whether someone got the first dose and the second dose and not just tracking from the vaccinee, the person standpoint, but also from uh, ensuring that the supplies are reaching there. So if we ever have a shortage, we then have to very quickly reconfigure the allocation algorithm in the supply chain to say, at least those who have received the first dose should get the second dose. And let's allocate the right supplies to those vaccination points or those vaccination rooms. 
And that's a very uh, challenging area to, uh, to develop. Uh, like I said earlier, there is limited infrastructure for ultra cold chain, but that doesn't mean that we cannot distribute an ultra cold chain requiring vaccine in regions that do not have uninterrupted power or the regions that do not have ultra cold chain fridges. Uh, there have been at least one, if not more, experiences in the part, past, including with the Ebola vaccine in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where with backup generators um, and other off-grid power arrangements and the use of a very specialized uh, container to, to transport the vaccine to the vaccination, uh, vaccination rooms, uh, this has been achieved. The cost effectiveness of doing that at such a large case, scale is questionable in the sense that you know, someone needs to work out the numbers to say, is that something we can follow at the scale which Brazil would need or India would need or uh, a, a large country with large population would need. But technically it's feasible, techno-economic feasibility uh, is to be determined. The second thing about um, ultra cold chain and especially the nucleic acid vaccines or the mRNA one in specific is that we should think about it not just from the standpoint of what accomplishes our current requirements. We also have to think about what is a more versatile platform which can be usable for a future pathogen. So let's think beyond COVID-19 and ask ourselves the question, which of these technology platforms, even if it's not seeming like the best suited uh, because it requires high infrastructure, but if that's the one which will give us very quickly uh, a vaccine for uh, a future pathogen which, which requires um, a vaccine, then uh, perhaps it is worth investing at least some resources in developing that infrastructure so that at least we have readiness uh, for the use of such a vaccine. Okay, so the key challenge overall, not just in Brazil, but you know, globally everywhere, is the fact that we, we see a lot of news report in media saying a country has bought 5 billion doses, 1.5 billion doses, large numbers being thrown around. But it is exchanging doses as if all of them have succeeded and all of them can be used interchangeably. Uh, but the reality is, of what countries have put pre-purchase agreements, only a few of the candidates will succeed. And what we want to do as society is to have as much manufacturing capacity as we can and put it for those candidates, those vaccine candidates, which succeed and succeed and achieve high degrees of efficacy and also field effectiveness. And this means we need the ability to reconfigure the capacity, the capacity, not just manufacturing capacity, perhaps also input material. So let's imagine the scenario in which two companies, company A and company B, both have competing candidates, company A succeeds, uh, and company B's candidate does not meet the threshold uh, that we think is required or is uh, significantly lower than company A's. But both companies have manufacturing plants, both for bulk vaccine production and have contracted capacity for fill and finish. They've also bought wires, they've also bought other input materials. We want to take what company B has and give it to company A in a way. I'm exaggerating this to just prove, prove the concept here so that company A can make more of a successful product that society needs. And who does that role is unclear. It's unclear at the global level, but it's also increasingly unclear at national level where country governments have set up uh, contracts with multiple manufacturers, including some in-country manufacturers. And then it's a question of how will we reserve the right to switch the, the contract to make product A versus product B. So an example would be um, if a country government has uh, contracted a fill and finish manufacturing site using public taxpayer dollars, uh, would they then ask that fill and finish site to switch to doing fill and finish for a different vaccine uh, in case the one they have contracted for doesn't work and how quickly will that site reconfigure? So these are little seemingly smaller problems in manufacturing, but actually uh, having more capacity to make the vaccine that everybody wants 
is something that we will need in the absence of that we will continue to work in a mode where people will say i need more i need more uh, all of the rationing agreements and other things so we need to think about that we need to think about how to incentivize more capacity for making not just vaccines but vaccines vials other things that are needed for the scale of effort and this gets into things such as how do governments uh, incentivize capacity scale out in addition to scale up and scale out implying that the company which has the vaccine uh, also works to license it out to additional manufacturers uh, globally including low and, middle income, low and middle income countries many manufacturers are willing but there isn't a, a right platform to connect the two then is switching to distribution so if, let's say we solve the manufacturing problems to the best that we can um, typically the structure of distribution in most countries is like this there is a, a federal government purchasing and, and storage point from there it goes to state government storage from there it goes to city or district government storage from there it goes to hospitals and then from hospitals if there are smaller clinics which also have vaccination points it goes to those so there are four or five layers in the vaccine distribution system and in routine settings, yes, the four or five layers may work, but I think there's a lot of research which shows that even for regular settings, leave aside what the COVID-19 vaccine will be, even for routine settings, it is harder to, um, it is harder to work with a system which has multiple levels because small changes in demand at the vaccination room uh, as you go up many layers in the system starts to become big amplification in the variability and we don't want such variability because we will see some ups and downs in the demand at the vaccination room level. Um, so having fewer layers is good. It's good for COVID-19 vaccines. It's good for vaccination program in general. It's good for the NIB uh, more broadly. And what that will do is um, allow us to go more direct. More direct helps in two ways. One is that the needs for cold chain or ultra cold chain are now only at two or fewer levels in the system. So if you go directly from federal to state to every vaccination uh, room, then you need cold chain only at the federal and the state level. If you also go to the city and the hospital, then you need more ultra cold chain or cold chain, depending upon the type of vaccine at these intermediate levels, which is very hard to establish. So a more centralized and fewer levels in, in the system structure helps. Uh, it helps for the needs of COVID-19 vaccines. It also helps to build greater accountability and better performance in the routine vaccine supply chain. So this is, an area where reforming it for COVID-19 will also give us long-term benefits for the immunization program. Clinic level demand forecasting is an area which we often don't think as much about. Once again, we keep thinking about cold chain is our problem, ultra cold chain, where will we get it? But we have to keep in mind, we have a scarce number of doses, very limited number of doses. Every clinic is being asked to requisition or indent how many vaccines they need. Some initially they'll get allocated, but as we move to more routine distribution, we'll have to depend upon the vaccination room telling us, oh, I think I got too many last time. No, not as many people are coming here. I need less, I need X amount. If you ask them to say, we'll only deliver to you once every month, then they have to forecast what is their demand for the next month. If you tell them, we'll deliver to you every day, then all they have to do is forecast how much is needed for the next 24 hours. And that is much easier. So we have to increase the frequency with which we deliver uh, to each of the vaccination rooms. Now, admittedly, this may not work in some regions in Brazil and in many other countries similar to Brazil, where infrastructure is such that you can't go everywhere daily or weekly. So there we have to manage appropriate buffers and so on. But in the rest of the, the uh, vaccination rooms, it should be as frequent as possible. Okay, then I think we need to think about um, information flows. And by information flows, we mean every bit of information about how vaccines have moved, who has obtained 
who has gotten them back? Uh, is it being collected systematically? This will be more important because some of the vaccines are two dose. Um, but even if it was a single dose vaccine, we would need this. This is also important for um, managing accountability because we are working with a system in which we are allocating limited quantities based on a prioritization criteria that everybody agrees on through a scientific uh, consensus process. Um, there are chances of lots of things going wrong and not being able to adhere to our initial prioritization unless we can get good information about where did how many number of doses go and so on. So that's important, getting that information. And then I want to stop by sharing uh, about four or five companies or six companies who are uh, solving different aspects of this problem in different countries in the world. One is a company called Macrowise, which solves the problem of clinic level demand forecasting. So trying to determine based on how many, how many people walk into a clinic, its catchment area, other things as to what would be the likely uh, need or, or forecast. Zipline is a drone company which has delivered um, other products, including vaccines though, in hard to reach areas. So the drone delivers a small quantity of vaccines uh, and it is doing large scale distribution in Rwanda, Ghana, uh, North Carolina, and the United States. Uh, a company called Logistimo, which does stock and flow information, a company called Simprints, which helps with biometric identification to make sure that the first dose and the second dose are tied back. Um, a company called Nextleaf Analytics, which does temperature monitoring and analytics, and um, a company called Parcel, which does cargo insurance. And by cargo insurance, we mean um, the chances of vaccine cargo getting diverted or stolen or theft or something else happening to it are extremely high. We've already seen attempts of cyber hacking on the electronic part of the supply chain. So once the physical part starts, we want to ensure high security. But in addition to high security, we can do this with sensors and insurance products. So Parcel uh, does exactly that. I want to stop there, I think, uh, with the message that there is a, a, a lot of complexity in distributing COVID-19 vaccines. But if we do this right, uh, not only will we solve the immediate problem at hand of how to create the right distribution structure for COVID-19 vaccines, but hopefully we'll also use this as an opportunity to reform our vaccine distribution system in a way that routine vaccination improves also. It becomes more efficient, it becomes um, higher coverage, more equitable, and so on. And there are many opportunities like this which achieve both. They are what I call as no regret moves. And that's certainly worth pursuing now, even though we don't know all the details about which vaccines, what products. Thank you. Back to you, Professor Victor. Professor Victor, you are muted. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Yadav, for your comprehensive presentation. Well, uh, now uh, we move on to the question and answers block. And um, please, I ask to the speakers to keep their cameras on. And um, well, we have uh, several questions and uh, I will try to put some of them in only one package. Um, well, um, the questions came from Tiago Jokura, it's a journalist, and uh, Professor Euclides de Mesquita uh, from Unicamp. Uh, well, the vaccines seem very effect effective against the disease, but uh, it is not known if they prevent the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. So there is a danger that the population will become complacent with the promising vaccine news. Uh, then some of the questions uh, about this fact. The first is how much more difficult will be to ensure adherence of non-pharmacological guidelines and restrictions when a vaccine is available to many 
but others remain unprotected. And the second question, when will we have a prospect of herd immunity in Brazil? Um, well, I think we can can start with these two questions. Then uh, I will uh, direct to you the, the other question. These questions are for all the the panel. Then uh, it's uh, for for all the speakers. In fact, can I can I make a first question like ladies Dr. first, Vitor? <laughs> ladies first. You are, okay, all, you are all too kind. <laughs> Very nice. Well, actually, this is, this is as, as a clinician, Victor, I have heard this question many times about this sort of magical expression, which, which is herd immunity. And I used to explain that herd immunity is not a clinical, I would say, indicator, or, you know, it's a vaccination indicator. So we do achieve herd immunity when you have a vaccine that could cover at least 60% of a determined population. And this is what we do have in some vaccines in Brazil, for instance. What we do expect with all this, uh, this I would say this compound of different vaccines that would be approved in, in well, more, uh, I would say very, um, uh, probably accepted and, and adopted in Brazil is that we can reach a herd immunity if we do achieve a good coverage of population with these different vaccines. And so this is something that has to be clarified. In terms of whether the vaccines would, would uh, I would say, avoid transmission, this is something as far as I know, that is not responded yet. Maybe Dr. Yadav can complete this, this consideration, but as far as I know, no. But from my point of view, if, if one of these of this vaccines, all the whole amount of them, could avoid the severity of the diseases is what we are, for instance, trying to demonstrate with the BCG vaccine, which is an old vaccine, very well known. What we are, uh, the two objectives of this phase three is to determine whether it could uh, in, uh, avoid the contamination, the disease, or in other words, if it, it can attenuate the severity of one episode of COVID-19. And so if a vaccine achieve the second objective, I would say that in terms of this uh, level of pandemic disease that we have, it would be very, very worthy. Professor Vuter, please unmute yourself. Please, uh, someone would like to add something? For sure. Uh, Yadav, Dr. Roca, no? I think Dr. Margaret covered very well this answer. So most of this, this answers, we, 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 we don't have the how to answer properly, especially regarding the, the how these vaccines will avoid to the transmission. So uh, I think she covered very well these questions. Professor Victor, um, the only thing I will add, and again, you know, fully agree with Professor Margaret about, you know, transmission and other things related to the vaccines or the vaccine candidates. I think one thing to keep in mind is that if the distribution is inequitable, even in the medium term, some particular geographies get high coverage, some other geographies don't. Then we don't know how will it translate into social behavior about keeping non-pharmaceutical interventions still going. Right? Because small subgroups of population in a particular geography would have been vaccinated, and if large numbers have been vaccinated, they would I mean, their social behavior would be less perhaps adherent to non-pharmaceutical interventions. Other regions, maybe yes. And then how will this social phenomenon diffuse from one geography to another? 
are things that we don't know. I mean, these are you know intrinsically social phenomena, and therefore the most important part that this reminds us is whatever happens, we ought to keep equity, and we should try to get as much as many doses as we can in terms of manufacturing capacity, so that we we can cover as much of the country in a compressed timeline. Thank you. Well, uh, we have another question. Uh, it's, um, do the vaccines cover a broad spectrum of virus? Uh, can an immune person be contaminated again by a genetically modified form of the, vir the virus? Uh, please, uh, I don't know. Dr. Margaret? Uh, well, well, again, Victor, there are some uh, questions that have been raised uh, for which, uh, as far as I know, again, we don't have a precise response. And we investigators are very, I would say, careful in affirming things that we don't know demonstrated by good studies. And the, this question of reinfection, I would I would respond, yes, reinfection will be possible in COVID-19 with different genomas, as, as we know. The first case was published by the Hong Kong case uh, which presented that presented the disease in April, and then he traveled to Europe and he brought again another different genoma. And so for this, we should have the study, uh, the, the genotyping of the whole uh, amount of cases that can be presented uh, with suspicion of, uh, of reinfection. We are having some cases in Brazil. We have some cases under, under evaluation. The problem is that we don't have, in many of these cases, a good documentation about the first episode, the very first one. And so it will be necessary to have both. And uh, a lack of time over I don't know whether in US they, you are using Professor Yadav the same, the same uh, definition, but here we are considering uh, a gap uh, with, uh, uh, of uh, 16, uh, 60 days, two months at least, between the first episode and an eventual second one. And so this is a criteria that we are using, but we have some cases under evaluation. I would respond, yes, it is possible, but from my point of view, it will be very, very unusual and almost rare cases. I don't know, I would like to, to listen about the US consideration. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Margaret. Uh, well, we have a question here uh, for Dr. Iadav, but uh, uh, I think that um, Dr. Hoka could make some reflection also. It's, um, it's about uh, global solidarity. The WHO COVAX initiative, will it work? Good yes. question. Good question. <laughs> Tiago, go on. So I'll share my viewpoints. I think, again, um, the answer to this question, as we'd say, we'll, we'll only know in retrospect in time. Um, so I think two things are important. One is for a country to have access to a diverse portfolio of vaccines. And by diverse, we've done some studies to show that if you want a high degree of probability that you have at least one candidate that meets um, the, the pre-specified threshold of efficacy, then perhaps a portfolio that consists of six or seven candidates or more of different types, one mRNA, one viral vector, on an activated virus, so on. So you have a diverse set of vaccine candidates, then it'll guarantee you that one or two, or you know, if you're lucky, maybe more succeed. Uh, and it's not possible for every country individually to contract with a diverse portfolio of vaccine developers. I mean, you know, Brazil is a large country, but imagine 
other uh, neighboring countries in Latin America with a smaller population base, it's harder to say, yes, we will contract with seven or eight different uh, vaccine developers. So that is a role that COVAX plays, and that is an extremely crucial role. Now, the total number of supply doses is limited. And given that many of the high income countries have already contracted a, a large portion of such doses, COVAX will only be able to give initially three to 5% of the population and then eventually 20% of the population. Right? So it's still below what would be the requirement for quote unquote herd immunity. Um, and that means its success is not meant to, to cover the entire needs of what a country requires for her immunity levels. And you know, some may say, well, as a result, we don't think it's gonna work because it's only giving us 20%. But I think at least getting that 20% with a degree of certainty that that will be from a diverse portfolio and because it's a diverse portfolio, you would at least have access to one or two vaccines which achieve the efficacy. So that's the, that's the value of COVAX. Again, you know, some parts are not exactly the way countries are, are expecting uh, them to be. The second thing to keep in mind as we think about COVAX is that uh, it also gives the ability to do good price negotiation um, you know, because it's in a time where supply, supply capacity is scarce. Every country trying to negotiate with individual manufacturers doesn't give them the chance to uh, have the buying power or have the knowledge to say, I know you've given this price to another country. So COVAX has some ability to negotiate prices better. So on those fronts, on, on portfolio diversity, price negotiation, I think it'll achieve its objective. Uh, the, the downside is that it doesn't have enough doses. And at this point, I think it doesn't have a contract to supply um, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. But uh, again, the important part is at this time, they may very well um, soon also have some supplies from the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine to supply. But I'd love to hear what um, Dr. Hoka and uh, Dr. Margaret have to share about this. Okay, hey, thank you. Dr. Hoka, would you like to think? Yes, uh, so COVAX facility is something that we've never seen before. It's, uh, it's in, we are in the middle of the pandemic, something should be done, the WHO, organize this this group with CEPI and with Gavi and they structure in the way that uh, as uh, Professor Yadab said it's to provide that equi equitative access but uh, anyway we will cause some limitations to get in the worst case five percent in the best case 20 percent of the population attended by COVAX uh, it, it's a starting point that at least uh, some countries that in, in other situations should negotiate it directly with the manufacturer can be the, the worst uh, situation at, at this moment, especially for the low income, income countries. So uh, the, the idea, it, it, it's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, if it will work or not, honestly, I hope so, because uh, maybe it's not the case of Brazil, but many countries, even in more impacted for the pandemic or even with uh, some uh, uh, health systems uh, with no conditions or no budget to, 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 to procure the vaccines, we will need to access this, these vaccines. And uh, the, the portfolio, it, it, it's very interesting because they, they invest in nine different candidates and starting coming from the starting point that at least two or three of them will work to get at the end about two billion doses that will cover uh, not the total population in the globe but honestly it's a, it's a good part at least for some people that are comor comorbidity or prof health professionals so uh, i think the the idea it's uh, it's it's very important. Uh, I was happy to hear that Brazil support that, but uh, uh, other countries you need more the, the COVAX facility that the high income countries or 
or countries like Brazil that is is, is procuring the vaccine. So uh, I'm praying to to it works and uh, for the global. And we saw that the pandemic it don't, don't the pandemic it doesn't respect the borders. So it's a way not all some countries to have the the, the total access to these vaccines. Over. Okay, thank you. Dr. Margaret, would you like to, to make some yes. questions about uh, global solidarity? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I would like to make a short comment on this, Victor. First of all, we have to be realistic, and I am trying to be realistic all the time, providing people the, the real, I would say, information about the, these inequalities. And COVAX tends and tries to sort of diminish, reduce these inequalities in terms of access. But we have to be realistic. We all have, if we sum the whole amount of capacity of production of the whole number of vaccines, how many doses we'll have throughout the next year? Less than 3 billion, less. So we are going to cover at a maximum one third of the, 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 the human population of this planet. So it's, 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 it's something really dramatic. And if you add to this uh, real, uh, real, I would say figure, uh, the inequality of access in some poor countries. COVAX initiative is something that has to be, I would say, uh, highly uh, defended and highly supported by not only by countries, by the academic community in all, in all the world. And in our terms, uh, Brazil in South America, maybe Professor Yadav is not aware of this, Brazil is the only country in, in Latin America, Professor Yadav, that is capable to produce vaccines and through uh, Fiocruz, my institution, and through Butantan in Sao Paulo. So our intention and our compromise in terms of not only humanitarian, but geographically speaking, is to provide vaccines through uh, the, the production of the Fiocruz and maybe Butantan could be, I cannot respond through by Butantan, of course, uh, but Fiocruz is, is, is um, uh, being, um, is programming its production to produce at least 40 million doses, which will be capable, uh, uh, monthly, which will be capable to cover Latin American countries, the, the, the more, I would say, with more difficult countries, uh, our neighbor countries, for only to provide you this information. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, um, we are reaching the, the end of this uh, webinar, and uh, I will give the floor to each of our speakers for final remarks. We can start with uh, uh, Dr. Margaret, please. <laughs> again, again, ladies first, again. thank yeah. you so much. I thank you so much. First of all, Victor, I would like to deeply uh, thank you for this invitation, very prestigious invitation. You know that people from Rio, it's, I'm teasing, I'm teasing my colleagues from Sao Paulo because we always envy FAPESP. Uh, I studied, I made my doctorate, Professor Yadav, in Sao Paulo. And so the, 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 the Federal University of Sao Paulo is a sort of my alma mater as well. And although I am from Rio, but you know, FAPESP is so powerful. And so, you know, that we really do envy in Rio. But anyhow, so I would like to really thank this very kind invitation from Luis Mello of Fapesh and this prestigious opportunity to be in touch with uh, Tiago Roca and Professor Yadav as well. And hopefully I could have been useful for to stimulate these reflections and these discussions about vaccines and this great challenge we are facing not only to control the pandemic, but to organize the, the humanitarian, I would say, an efficient uh, coverage of the new vaccines for our people. Thank you so much. Many thanks. Uh, please, Dr. Hocker. Professor Vitor, thank you very much. Uh, and also, it was a pleasure to be here with Dr. Margaret and Professor Yadav, sharing some, uh, some parts of our experience with uh, FAPESP and the colleagues that are connecting. Uh, 
these discussions uh, should keep uh, because we we face the, the we are facing yeah, the pandemic we we saw uh, a very speed a uh, speed that we've never seen before for the, the vaccine development this is a legacy for the future uh, pandemics so the world will be more prepared uh, here at Butantan uh, I had the opportunity to leave also the pandemic in 2009 and 2010 for the flu uh, the swine flu pandemic sure it's not possible to compare but we we took a lot of uh, lessons learned from that pandemic that we are applying uh, nowadays COVAX facility many people uh, don't say that they don't say that but COVAX facility it's because of the flu uh, swine flu pandemic in 2009 and 2010 when rich countries secure most of the vaccine production and because of that to have more access to the globe this is a very important matter that we have now to discuss and, and to approach now we are entering in the in a very critical path that is a regulatory path a regulatory evaluation and in the sequence we have all this logistics and this is another challenge that the the globe the globe we will face not just brazil the globe and companies, uh, manufacturers, uh, the society should be prepared and to understand what the challenge that we, we have uh, from here to, to the next two, one, two years of distribution. So I think today we, we cover some of these challenges and I thank you for, for best before this uh, great opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Hoka. Dr. Yadav, please your final remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Victor. And uh, like uh, Professor Margaret and Professor Hoka, I'm going to um, say it is um, an honor and privilege to be a part of this. Thank you, FAPES, for organizing it. Uh, I also fully uh, recognize and have in the past learned about the work that Fio Cruz and Instituto Putantan do for providing vaccines, not just to Brazil, but to so many countries in the world through Gavi and, and, and even direct supplies. So um, I'm hopeful that they will continue in that journey, not just for Brazil, but for other countries in the region. Once we get to a stage that we have a few successful candidates and we need to manufacture them at a larger scale. Um, I think when we talk about distribution, we often are getting too focused on cold chain. Every discussion seems to be, oh, we don't have the cold chain. How do we get that? I think we need to get away from that a little bit and focus on information. If we can get the right information from every vaccination room about who's getting vaccinated, how much stock is reaching where, um, I think that will be a very critical tool in creating a distribution system that achieves its objectives. The infrastructure constraints, yes, they exist, but I think some of them will resolve. Thermal stability of vaccine is something we learn over time. Maybe we get surprised by how stable the liquid encapsulate to the mRNA is or something else like that comes our way. So I think we should be optimistic on those things as well. Uh, and yeah, thank you again. Thank you. Well, um... In my name and uh, from Professor Luis Melo and uh, all the staff of FAPESP, I thank uh, the audience for following this webinar and for contributing questions. Many thanks to our speakers for coming to share with us uh, uh, your ideas and uh, for this very stimulating uh, discussion. Thank you so much. I also take the opportunity to thank the FAPES team for their full uh, support for the webinar infrastructure. Once again, thank you so much. Goodbye.